Hi everyone who's just joined. Uh, thank you for joining today's social mobility uh, masterclass session. Uh, I think we've got a uh, lot of participants joining, so we'll just uh, we'll, we'll kick off. Hi, um, I'm Edward, uh, Employee Engagement Lead at the Social Mobility Commission, uh, and welcome to uh, Social Mobility Commission's masterclass series of webinars for employers. Um, so today's session uh, will focus on uh, hiring and recruitment and the role that uh, employers can play in strengthening social mobility through equitable uh, recruitment practices. Just a bit of uh, housekeeping before we start. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, uh, please pop them in the questions box uh, throughout the session and presentations, and we will uh, endeavour to answer as many of your questions at the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Uh, and just to let all the attendees know, this webinar uh, will be recorded um, and will be available to watch on our YouTube channel after today's live event. Uh, so the slides have also been sent to all the attendees. If we just have a look at the first slide. Just uh, move on to the next slide, yes. Uh, so today's uh, session will explore the role of hiring and recruitment practices in diversity and inclusion strategies aimed at supporting social mobility. So many common hiring practices create artificial barriers for people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. However, there are simple actions all employers can take to diversify their recruitment practices to promote diversity at each stage of the hiring process. But today I will consider some uh, effective actions employers can take to support uh, socioeconomic diversity within their organisations and how organisations can widen their talent pool. So I'm also joined today by my colleague uh, Danny Matthews, who's the uh, Apprenticeship and Community Resourcing Lead at the Co-op, uh, and Hazel Ramika, Academy's business partner at the Co-op. Uh, so they'll be highlighting some of the actions that the Co-op has taken make their recruitment practices more inclusive uh, and we'll be giving some practical examples of how uh, co-op have widened their talent pool uh, to create access to meaningful opportunities for all. So if we just have a look at the uh, next slide. So what is social mobility? Um, so social mobility is about ensuring that a person's occupation and income is not tied to where they started in life and ensuring that people of all backgrounds have equal opportunities. It's about ensuring that uh, socioeconomic background doesn't determine your outcomes in life. Um, so put simply, it's about fairness and ensuring that everybody has the chance to succeed, regardless of what their parents did, where in the country they grew up uh, or any other social characteristics. Broadly speaking, there are two types of social mobility. The relative social mobility, so that's ensuring that people have the opportunities through hard work and talent to improve their own personal situation compared to that of their parents, and absolute social mobility. So that's ensuring that overall, each generation has better living standards than the next. So the actions we will discuss today will consider how employers can take steps in supporting socioeconomic inclusion uh, within your own organisations and social mobility generally. Um, so why does socioeconomic diversity matter? There's lots of research out there that demonstrates diverse organisations are successful organisations, and this is even more critical to consider as we emerge from COVID-19. So companies who focus on socioeconomic background widen their talent pool and increase their competitive advantage as a result. And they can also see greater levels of performance across the business, with 43% of businesses with more diverse workforces having higher profits. There are also uh, many other benefits to organisations that prioritise diversity in their workforce, um, such as in, improved employee engagement, satisfaction, and in, uh, loyalty to their employee. So uh, leading companies are already doing their part to boost social mobility. So organizations like uh, Channel 4, KPMG, PwC and Compass 
are already developing and optimizing their HR policies and processes to increase socioeconomic diversity and inclusion of their workforce. But you might have seen the uh, recent announcement by KPMG on their goal of uh, setting targets for the number of employees from working class backgrounds uh, or PwC's announcement that they will publish their uh, class pay gap data. So we at the Social Mobility Commission welcome um, these announcements and hope that the commitment made by uh, KPMG and PwC will drive uh, other organisations to consider uh, data transparency and uh, workforce targets when um, considering socioeconomic um, background in workforces. So if we just have a look at the uh, next slide. So um, what steps should an organisation take uh, to develop and make their hiring and recruitment processes inclusive? So the first step is to develop a clear overarching strategy for diverse and inclusive recruitment. So this could involve uh, setting out the strategic, strategic plan, uh, focusing on activities and the success measures required. So identifying what is the current picture of socioeconomic diversity in your workforce, um, where the gaps are, and understanding how recruitment could target these gaps. So organizations uh, will also need to consider the activity required. So focusing on achieving specific outcomes, uh, for example, the number and level of apprenticeships your organization could offer and how best to target them. So we also recommend uh, setting out recruitment and workforce targets, uh, which could help drive internal success measures. So it's important to ensure that targets are clear and realistic um, and that uh, progress towards them can be tracked. So one way of increasing the likelihood that goals can be reached is by setting time bound targets. So what change will be achieved and by when? So organizations could also consider uh, targeted outreach at uh, specific partners. So for example, schools and FE colleges in your local area uh, and build an understanding of the local partnerships, um, uh, local landscape and partnerships to start developing these uh, relationships. So the next stage to consider is uh, delivery. Um, so delivery is, is key driver ensuring that your recruitment practices are inclusive. Um, so things that organizations need to consider are um, things like if your, if your selection processes are consistent with all candidates, um, for example, uh, avoiding preferential treatment uh, for those who apply earlier, uh, with the goal of ensuring that processes are standardized and uh, transparent for all applicants. And we also advise that you advertise uh, all employment opportunities to apply for your organization and be clear about what is, what is required. So this could involve uh, advertising definitions of the competencies that are sought uh, and the characteristics of those who progress within your organization. So organizations uh, should also ensure that apprenticeships, uh, internships, and other work experience opportunities are sufficiently targeted at those who would benefit the most, uh, particularly underrepresented groups. So the final stage to consider is evaluation. So the evaluation is key to understand if uh, any interventions carried out have been successful and achieved the de uh, desired result of making your recruitment more inclusive and your workforce uh, more diverse. So for this, you could uh, compare applicant data with uh, external benchmarks to assess how well they reflect uh, the eligible talent pool. So organizations could also examine whether aspects of the selection process uh, might disadvantage uh, certain groups and redesign the process if needed. So use your data to uh, understand where the process can be approved. Uh, both on applicants and those that are successful in their recruitment campaigns. So the key thing here is um, evaluation and iteration uh, of all of your processes. 
So if you do implement changes to your recruitment policies, always evaluate them to see if they have had the desired effect and the overall outcome that, that you wanted. If we just look at the uh, next slide. So if we take a look at um, some of the specific actions uh, to take when considering how an organisation can attract uh, a diverse range of candidates for potential roles and how an organisation should uh, connect with individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So your processes for uh, targeting and attracting um, individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds will ultimately uh, develop and drive your talent pipeline. Uh, so widening your talent net will enable you to find uh, individuals from diverse backgrounds. So key to this is uh, targeted in, uh, recruitment. So engage with and target specific institutions uh, to develop engagement activities that connect your organisation directly with schools, colleges or universities uh, to search for the widest talent pool. So ensuring that recruitment is from uh, institutions that, are, uh, that have diversity in their student bodies. So for example, um, targeting your local state school or further education college. So the key thing here is uh, building and developing local partnerships uh, at the earliest stage uh, to take advantage of all the available talent in your local area. So when um, considering the job description and marketing materials, uh, your organisation should consider um, the message in the materials and have a wide appeal uh, by using inclusive language. So uh, language such as we're looking for potential rather than experience. So employers at an advanced stage in this process uh, could consider undertaking uh, market research to understand how applicants from different demographics uh, respond to marketing materials um, and then this could be informed to, uh, uh, on how future uh, recruitment campaigns could be developed. The one thing we also uh, recommend is advertise for skills and not qualifications which can create barriers for applicants. So if a qualification isn't necessary for a specific role you could remove the qualification barrier in the recruitment process. The qualifications can often exclude disadvantaged applicants who may not have had the best opportunities, but who could thrive in your organisation. For the uh, application recruitment and selection process, uh, be clear and transparent about uh, the process and what is being assessed at each stage and give easy access to the evaluation details to all applicants. So if you give applicants the details on the application process and the hiring approaches uh, to support diversity and inclusion and encourage a range of talent to apply. We recommend uh, a mixed approach uh, to uh, the selection process. So of uh, competency, competency based evaluation with um, strength based assessments and situational judgment testing uh, to get a balanced view of all candidates. Structured and unstructured interviews both have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, but unstructured interviews are more likely to allow um, unfair bias to creep in uh, and influence some of the decisions you made. So we would advise structured, competency-based interviews. Uh, and we also recommend rather than re uh, relying on um, just purely on interviews, uh, ask candidates to perform tasks that they would be expected to perform in the role they're applying for. Um, so use their performance on these tasks to assess their suitability uh, for the role um, and then standardise these tasks and how they're scored to ensure uh, fairness across all candidates. That was a little look at uh, attraction and the best way to attract a diverse range of candidates. So if we just move on to the next slide. So if we consider um, entry routes. So how should your organisation create multiple entry routes uh, to, to connect and recruit diverse applicants? So apprenticeships are, uh, are often the go-to recruitment mechanism for employers looking to diversify their workforce. 
However, our uh, SMT's research published in uh, 2020 showed that apprenticeships from working class backgrounds face barriers at every stage of the process, from uh, the recruitment to the quality of training and progression opportunities on completion. However, they can be a powerful tool to enable social mobility if targeted and implemented correctly. The apprenticeship offer um, your organisation should have should be uh, a high quality apprenticeship program with uh, progression routes into the organisation or the wider industry once complete. Uh, and it should also include wraparound pastoral care uh, from line managers and buddying arrangements for all new apprentices. So apprenticeship programmes should be uh, targeted and ensure higher level apprenticeships are aimed at less uh, advantaged individuals. So employers should uh, offer apprenticeships at different levels uh, and provide training in soft skills as well as technical skills. So apprenticeships are often considered a great ladder of social mobility and they can support employment and enable individuals uh, to gain skills in non-academic contexts. They can also uh, upskill and reskill, uh, giving a second chance to those already in employment. However, em uh, employers should ensure that steps are taken to target apprenticeship programmes at those from disadvantaged backgrounds. So other things that employers could do, organisations should um, consider how introducing a range of entry routes into the business uh, could support diversity. So for example, uh, trainee and internships, uh, apprenticeships, as we've mentioned, and graduate programmes. And so to do this, uh, your organisations uh, could work with external partners, uh, career services, uh, and other experts to design uh, events, programme and uh, digital activities that engage uh, underrepresented groups. So if considering uh, trainee and internships, uh, make sure that they are paid positions uh, to ensure that they do not discourage those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds applying to, the, uh, to these roles. So that's a range of um, uh, entry routes that your organisation uh, could consider, uh, but do ensure if you do implement any, uh, any new entry routes that you target these specifically at those from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and you do monitor and evaluate if those programmes have been successful. If we just take a look at the uh, next slide. So this is uh, considering geography uh, and how your uh, organisation can recruit. So you'll probably hear this uh, more than once today, but uh, talented people are everywhere and opportunity is not. And that's a key thing to always remember. Um, so head offices are often uh, located in major cities, uh, so living or travelling costs can exclude those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, from applying to roles. Uh, uh, as research has shown, people from higher socioeconomic backgrounds are the most geographically mobile group. So, uh, Social Mobility Commission's research, which was uh, called Moving Out to Move On, highlights that nearly 60% of those who move to study or work have one or both parents belonging to a higher managerial occupation compared with 40% who stay in their hometown. It also shows that those from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to move to London and the Southeast because of financial constraints and connections to family and friends in their hometowns, coupled with a lack of connection to London. So when considering uh, geographical opportunities, uh, organisations should consider how you are removing geographical blockers and barriers to entry uh, and progression in your organisation. So uh, flexible working offers uh, the opportunity to level the playing field when it comes to geographical opportunities. Uh, and with the, the revolution uh, in the flexible working practices that have been caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, organisations should harness this to um, opportunity to create more diverse workforces. So organisations should um, evaluate the impact of 
flexible working arrangements on your ability to uh, track, uh, recruit and uh, develop staff from uh, entering and progressing through your organisation without having to move to major city centres. So uh, flexible working arrangements uh, should also be championed by uh, senior leaders and communicated th throughout recruitment processes. So when uh, considering uh, geographical distribution of opportunities, uh, organisations could identify uh, social mobility cold spots across the UK uh, and investigate options uh, for improving your levels of attraction and recruitment from these areas. So if your business is expanding, uh, identify uh, opportunities for supporting uh, local economic renewal uh, by providing new employment, uh, as well as attracting new talent to your area from diverse geographical uh, areas and regions. And one of the other things we also advocate is uh, looking at how you would uh, tackle uh, regional distribution of roles and what's the best process to, to put in place for this. So uh, organizations could uh, also set targets uh, for offering uh, and take up of training opportunities uh, in regard uh, in regional hubs um, and where appropriate uh, could place headcount limits on hiring in London and other uh, expensive urban centres. Uh, so that was some of the things to think about when considering geography. Um, I'll just uh, finish there and just conclude just to say um, so that was some of the uh, ov an overview of some of the actions we do recommend that all uh, employers should take when considering hiring and uh, recruitment. Uh, we do encourage uh, all employers to review our, our toolkits that are available on our website uh, and reflect how your organization can uh, review and develop its recruitment practices to support uh, socioeconomic diversity within your organization. So all the uh, actions that we've mentioned uh, today uh, are on our website in our toolkit. Uh, so they are on there and can be uh, downloaded and reviewed. And we would encourage all organisations to do that. And there is also specific uh, guidance as well. I'm also uh, pleased to say that we're joined from uh, today by colleagues from the co-op. Um, so shortly I'll hand over to my uh, colleagues, Danny Matthews and Hazel Ramika. Uh, from the co-op, uh, just to hear some of the um, some of the actions co-op has taken to make their recruitment practices uh, more inclusive, um, and hear some practical examples uh, and insights on how they have widened their talent pool uh, to create uh, access to meaningful opportunities for all. Um, so I think uh, Hazel is going first. Uh, so if I could hand over to Hazel, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Edward, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here to talk to you about the work that we're doing at the co-op. Uh, if we go to the first slide, please. Um, so at co-op, um, we recognise that although talent is everywhere, opportunities are not, as Edward mentioned earlier, uh, making sure that everyone has the, an equal chance to fulfil their potential, regardless of their background, and tackling persistent inequalities in our society is fundamental to our vision of cooperating for a fairer world. As a purpose-driven organisation, we campaign on issues that are important to us and our members, not just those that directly benefit our business. Because of the pandemic, we face into the greatest and gravest challenge to social mobility we have experienced in generations. And that's why we're making it a priority both externally in our community work and internally, as you'll hear about today. We see it as our responsibility to encourage others to do the same and work closely with our supply chain partners to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and why, particularly in relation to the importance of apprenticeships and how we can work to promote uptake. We're really happy to be here today to share with you our insights and some learnings that we've gathered along the way. Can move to the next slide, please. We support our academies because of our commitment to communities, with education being a driver for improving communities. As sponsor of the Co-op Academies Trust, we have a unique relationship with our academies. However, we recognise our role in supporting schools and education more broadly to have a positive impact on the mobility of communities. Our support for our academies aligns to our vision for supporting communities 
with a focus on access to food, well, well-being and education and skills. These themes are complex and intertwined and integral to our wider activity around social mobility. Careers and supporting careers activity in our academies is a clear way we can ensure pupils and students have the skills, experience and knowledge to find their pathway, vocational or academic. We are working with the Co-op Academies Trust to develop a co-op careers offer which aligns to the Gatsby benchmark and enables our academies to provide outstanding CAG at both primary and secondary phase. With two special schools, we're also able to develop an offer for pupils and students with additional needs in both mainstream and specialist provision. You can move to the next slide, please. An example of one of the programmes that we've recently delivered is the Co-op Young Business Leaders. This is a piece of work where we have provided 20 paid work experience opportunities for students studying on a BTEC Level 3 Business Studies programme at Connell Co-op College uh, within the Co-op Academies Trust. The purpose of this piece of work was to provide a meaningful work experience alongside their study and a commitment to pay at the going rate for a role within the business. And this offered students an opportunity to earn while also continuing to study. Uh, and this um, piece of work is looking at how you can support that transition from childhood into adulthood, which is quite a, a informative piece of work and also a key part in people's lives uh, around how you can actually look at the additional pastoral support, which was referenced earlier, that might mean that there are additional challenges, particularly for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the purpose of this work is to really look at how we can support that pipeline of talent from our academies back into the business uh, and align to our apprenticeships programme which my uh, colleague uh, Danny will now pick up in terms of the work that we're doing in that space. Fab, thank you very much, Hazel, and thank you very much for having me here to, to, today. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Danny Matthews, and I work uh, within the resource and services team at the, at the co-op. And just for a little bit of context as to, to our organisation, clearly we're very committed to, uh, to social mobility across our business. Um, but for those who, who aren't too familiar with what we, what we do and, and a bit of context as to what I'll share in a second, um, we are primarily a retailer, so many of you may know us on the high street. Um, and one of the largest cooperatives in the world. Um, we also, though, have a funeral care business, legal services organisation, um, as well as uh, an insurance firm um, as, as well. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the co-op, you'll know that we've been around for a long time as, as, as such and, and really underpinned by our, uh, our values from a community perspective. So a lot of the work that we do do um, in this space um, isn't necessarily a a CSR initiative, um, like some organisations uh, might uh, position it, um, it's absolutely fundamental to who we are as a who we are as an organisation. Um, and I'm delighted to share some of those uh, those experiences um, and some of those learnings that we've had uh, along the way. Um, one thing I would call out though is that I think particularly in in this space, as for many organisations, there's there's always improvements to be made and, and lots of things still to learn. Um, so hopefully I can share some of our good experiences and also some of our key learnings that we've had today. So if, if I can just ask it to fit to the next slide, uh, please. Thanks very much. So, I mean, you can, I can sit here all day and talk about the different initiatives and activities that we, we've built into our processes and our resourcing approach over the past, uh, well, over the past number of years, um, but particularly focusing on, on that kind of three pillared approach that Ed mentioned before, you know, design, deliver and evaluate. Um, and, and also looking at these kind of four areas, uh, which I've singled out to take everyone through uh, today. Just for a bit of context in terms of recruitment, though, at the co-op. Um, so typically we have in the region of 60,000 colleagues um, across our organisation. Um, and importantly, I'd call out that that's across the whole of the UK as, as, as well. And, and our reach from a geography perspective is, is pretty vast. Um, from the islands of Scotland to the to the kind of the corner shops in the city of London, um, we've got uh, vacancies and uh, business areas um, in lots of different areas uh, of, of the UK, including coverage of, of areas of opportunity from a social mobility perspective. So I guess we're in a very position of luxury to have that that geographical footprint. Um, and in terms of resourcing, um, we recruit in the region of thirteen to fifteen thousand colleagues every single year, um, with the majority of that, as you can imagine, coming within our, within our food stores business. But of course, um, we also recruit at lots of different levels for lots of different specialisms and roles across our, across our organisation. 
Um, and on that point, I'd like to start with uh, our approach to creating opportunities and, of course, uh, what we've talked about already today, apprenticeships. So firstly, starting on the apprenticeship agenda, um, as an organisation, we've employed in the region of 5,000 apprentices since, um, since 2011, um, and that's across lots of different uh, standards and frameworks um, in our organisation. Um, from lots of different backgrounds as well. So I think the important thing to call out for us from a social mobility perspective, we see apprenticeships as, as an enabler to help uh, particularly young people get into their career uh, or onto the career ladder for want of a better phrase um, and, and have a lots of different opportunities across our business uh, to, uh, to support young people to enter a career at co-op. Um, but also we, we utilize apprenticeships as a way of enabling both internal colleagues and career changers to, to further their career development and importantly, gain access to education that they may never have had opportunities to access in their, in their past. And some really great examples of, of, of that across our business as, as such. So from an apprenticeship perspective, um, we work really closely with our learning providers to make sure that um, whilst the, the standard for apprenticeships might say you need, let's say uh, GCSEs or A-levels um, or equivalent, um, we will work very closely with our learning providers to really challenge that and reduce uh, reduce those requirements where uh, where possible um, for for apprenticeships specifically, um, and then in terms of uh, in terms of our kind of uh, kind of experience, should we say for apprentices, uh, we're really mindful that um, the support and the wraparound that's required for for apprentices, be that a sixteen year old coming out of school in, in their first uh, day in the life uh, of a co op colleague, um, or an individual fundamentally changing their career. Uh, from one sector to, uh, to a co-op role, um, we know that there's an importance for us to support colleagues to A, make sure that their experience is meaningful and, and B, make sure that their, uh, that, I guess their, their access, their learning, their development is, is what we would want it to be on, uh, on our apprenticeship programme. So really invest in time with our managers um, to make sure that they understand the programme, um, providing buddies and, and, in, and where possible mentors in place is a, is a really key part of our apprenticeship programs and something that we've learned quite a lot about in the past uh, few years, particularly. And I'd, and I'd particularly call out with, with, the young, with the younger audience, you know, I think there's a lot of assumptions sometimes that young people are um, tech savvy uh, and uh, kind of not necessarily workplace ready, but they've got some idea of the workplace. Realistically, um, it's important to make no assumptions. Um, and we've learned, we've learned sometimes the hard way in the past couple of years around that. But importantly, we've put lots of things in place, particularly the buddy scheme uh, and also uh, developing and evolving our programs to ensure that particularly younger people uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds or those who may never have had access to opportunities of work experience, for example, uh, before um, have the, the full support that they need to be successful in the workplace. Um, and, and I guess just on the apprenticeship piece, uh, one of our uh, probably uh, champion initiatives that we've, we've put into place in the past year, um, which is a bit of a shameless plug right now, is our apprenticeship uh, levy match service. Uh, so as an organisation, we, we recognise that there is obviously a lot of uh, reform to be done within the levy, um, but particularly uh, as an organisation our size, and there is a significant proportion of our apprenticeship levy which remains unspent. Um, and, and that's the same for a lot of large organisations. So rather than that money necessarily going back to, uh, to, to HMRC, um, as such, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, utilising it in the best way. So we've set up a, a co-op levy match service where effectively organisations um, can donate some of their unused levy to this uh, pot of money, if you want a better phrase, um, which then effectively smaller organisations can utilise to draw down on to bridge the cost gap uh, that they might have if they wanted to take apprenticeships uh, on themselves. And our ambitions in this space is to really try and drive uh, the increase and the uptake of apprenticeships across, across the UK. Um, and importantly, um, for organisations, particularly those receiving employers, uh, to, to offer those opportunities up to individuals from, uh, from diverse backgrounds, particularly younger people um, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds as well. So a really great initiative. Uh, that we set up and already we're at 200 apprentices placed. We only set it up in May. Uh, we've got five million pounds pledged there, there or thereabouts. Um, so really great um, opportunity for, for those on the call today um, to, to consider be that if you're a donating employer um, and you've got a little bit of spare levy, should we say, um, or a receiving employer and looking to, to employ apprentices yourselves 
um, as, as such. There's a link that's just gone in the chat. So if you are interested, feel free to take a look at that. And if you've got any questions over and above what's on the website, uh, feel free to let me know or get in contact with the team. All the details are, are on there. And then just focusing my final point in the creating opportunities piece is, is really about uh, is challenging our, our business areas and our managers. Um, as you can imagine, uh, as an organization with our size and the population of around about 5,000 hiring managers at any one time, uh, there are lots of different uh, perceptions and thoughts and opinions on, on diversity. And we've made significant progress to change those uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, but it's important that we keep uh, keep our finger on the pulse, for want of a better phrase, and make sure that our managers are uh, challenged during the recruitment process to be thinking inclusively, be that when they set the role up, so during a vacancy briefing, making sure that our resourcing partners are looking to remove barriers, and I'll come on to those in a second, um, but also um, when thinking about hiring decisions uh, as, as, as well, and really challenging managers to think outside of the box um, and think differently to maybe that typical blueprint that they might have had in their mind as to who they want to fulfill a vacancy uh, as such. And I think that's really particularly important when we think about those who may have not had the opportunity or the access to experiences in, in the past um, that, that many of us may have had the privilege and the opportunity to, to experience. So next, um, I would say, would be our removing barriers to entry approach. So over the, over the past number of years and continual, uh, continuously, we, we are always looking to improve our processes um, our way of thinking from a resourcing perspective to ensure that all candidates have an equal opportunity to apply for and be considered for a vacancy or a role at the co-op. A couple of kind of tangible things that we've made uh, made an impact on in the recent uh, recent past is uh, is removing the requirement for CVs to apply for our role. We were mindful that even just the ask of having a CV um, in a recruitment process can create a barrier. Whether or not someone has one or not is, is obviously a task for them to, to, to complete, but can also be quite a daunting uh, task when to think about what do I put on there? What if I don't have that much experience? Is it going to be enough to even get through that first stage of shortlisting? So uh, our new recruitment system that we've recently put into place um, has enabled us to remove the requirement uh, for CVs across our roles. Um, and, and that's a really help, been a really helpful tool when we think about how we've changed how we recruit uh, as an organization. So typically, um, a lot of organizations, including ourselves, will have taken the approach to recruit based upon experience. And, and unfortunately, uh, in the past, that was uh, based upon any role. So whether you were coming into the food store to work eight hours a week um, or joining us as a, a colleague um, at a, a management, management level in our business, um, we would only recruit on experience. Um, our learnings for that is actually to do a lot of the vacancies and jobs in our business you don't necessarily need those experiences, but what you do need are the right behaviors, the right values, um, and importantly, the potential uh, and ambition to learn uh, and develop yourself. So we've positioned ourselves now to assess based upon behaviors um, and skills uh, where necessary, um, rather than looking at experience through things like a CV as, as such, um, which helpfully, and, and we've seen that the statistics now show that we, we are recruiting a more diverse workforce into our, into our business. And, and we de genuinely believe that removing that barrier of experience has helped us go, go uh, make some progress in that, in that space. Um, the other piece, and I think Ed touched on it as well, around qualifications. So naturally, unfortunately, from an apprenticeship perspective, there are some standards which demand that you have to have qualifications for whatever reason. And we are working with learning providers, as I've mentioned, to remove those barriers. Uh, but also, we don't ask for degrees, uh, which I think is a really important thing from a social mobility perspective. You know, we're not looking necessarily for people to come out of university to uh, well, effectively join a, join a role. And that's, that's been a really great, uh, great opportunity for us to look at exactly what it is that we're looking for rather than taking the slightly aged approach now of uh, you need a degree to be, uh, to be any good at a, at a job as, as such. And, and realistically, that's not true. Um, university will give you knowledge, but ultimately other experiences and, uh, and other opportunities will help you to bring those uh, skills and potentially the knowledge to, to life. So we don't ask for degrees anymore. And I think that's really important when thinking about some of those small things that you can, uh, you can change or remove from your, your process to make a, a, quite an impact on the candidate base. Um, I think the other thing to call out as well is uh, we're also looking at, you know, in terms of our attraction approach, looking at operating within different, uh, different demographics. So yes, we use typical job boards, your Indeeds, LinkedIn's, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and we've used it, we've really used, used them in a different different light this year in, in light of diversity to, to really target specific audience groups by demographic or, uh, or make sure that our, our roles uh, are all available uh, on those sites, not using LinkedIn for those premium management roles and, and indeed for entry level as such, we're, we're really broadening how we approach that. But we've also um, invested in, in some partnerships as well from an attraction perspective um, to help us really reach, reach into those uh, specific demographics um, and, and, and really attract those individuals into, into our roles. Uh, and I'll come on to that in a second as well. Mindful of time, lots to cover. Um, and, and I think finally, just on the removing barriers to entry piece, um, one thing that Ed mentioned was around using data. Um, and one thing that we obviously have the fortune of, of being able to do is use our applicant tracking system to capture uh, diversity data, not use it in the, in the recruitment process from a and rightly so, from a, from a, a bias perspective, but make sure that we're, we're analyzing uh, the impact of certain parts of our process, impact of hiring decisions on specific demographics, and, and trying where we can as best to retrospectively put changes into place um, to make a, a positive impact on, on those who may be adversely impacted by any part of our, our process. And that's an always an ongoing uh, piece of work for us to, to, to look at. So the next part, uh, and probably the one where we've seen quite a lot of uh, kind of fruitfulness, I guess, come out of, is, is our investment in partnerships. And what I, I guess I mean by this is, is not only attraction uh, organizations, but working very closely with, with organizations such as charities and employability partners in certain parts of the UK um, to really help us to engage much more closely and, uh, and, and, and much more deeply, I guess with with those who are furthest away from the jobs market so for example you know we, we've got a really good connection with the the job center plus and, and DW, dwp um and, and we're in continuous communication with them to understand how we can best position position our opportunities and ourselves um, to support uh, individuals who are furthest away from the jobs market and, and they're a really great organization to to work through in terms of scale um, on the other side of things um you know we are also working with very localized organizations in in locations and geographies where we have uh, a business demand from a, from a hiring perspective, but also where we know that there are uh, social mobility cold spots or opportunities, opportunities um, areas of opportunity, sorry, uh, that we can, we can really make an impact in. So uh, one of the things that we've done this year from a partnerships perspective is worked with the Department for Work and Pensions on our Kickstart program and use data from the Community Wellbeing Index and uh, social mobility cold spot data to really target our opportunities and our vacancies in areas, not necessarily where the business need uh, the resource, but where we can have the biggest impact from a, a community and a society perspective as well. Taking a slightly different approach as to how, how we might have typically done it in the past. Um, and I guess from a partnerships perspective as well, one thing that we've really gained from those partners is, is being able to use their experience and knowledge to, to improve ourselves. You know, we don't know everything and, and we don't have lots of lots and lots of expertise across employability within our organization. So using and leaning on partners uh, such as uh, Catch22, Prince's Trust, Department for Work and Pensions to bring that knowledge to ourselves as a recruitment team, but also to upskill managers um, as well as has been a really, really uh, important uh, part of our relationships. Uh, and they've been able to help us get into those communities and reach much deeper into society than we would have ever been able to do through something like LinkedIn or indeed or our traditional uh, resourcing uh, channels, for of a better phrase. Um, and, and importantly as well, what we've made a decision on a lot of our partnerships is where we are investing time in, 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 in a program or an initiative. Um, we're also investing time in the colleagues in those partnerships as well. So they truly understand our business, they get our recruitment process, so they can coach and support people who are interested in vacancies, who are maybe a little bit less on a little bit lower on confidence of applying for vacancies because of their experiences uh, in the past um, to really succeed and to thrive uh, in our recruitment process. And typically, we actually remove a lot of those 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 process points uh, and actually move straight to interview and, and, and hire. So slimming down our process where we where we can. Uh, and finally, um, the innovation piece. I won't spend too much time on this because I know Ed will be wanting to get to, to questions. I'm sure there's a lot. Uh, to get through um, but just a couple of things to call out that we've we've, we've really um, kind of invested our time in recently so uh, we work very closely with BITC and ban the box to make sure that we're open 
to, to employing those who are uh, ex-offenders. Typically, a lot of individuals uh, who are currently within uh, the uh, management, the National Offenders Management Service are, um, are, are very much from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So we're keen to make sure that we are having a twofold impact. One, ensuring that people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds could get into employment. And by doing so, in, in inevitably reducing reoffending in our communities. We've, we've launched some really great pilots uh, and programs, uh, particularly in the Southeast um, around that. Um, and, and as well as our retail futures program where we set up an initiative with, a, with an organization uh, to, to inspire young people uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, often facing lots of barriers um, in, in their lives to, to access employment first and foremost in our business, uh, but also to, to really raise those aspirations around careers in retail um, and what their, their potential could, could look like from a careers perspective and importantly as well from a, a lifestyle perspective as, as well. Um, and, and finally, um, we've invested our time in, in, in lots of different initiatives such as virtual work experience um, where, we've, uh, where we've reached 1,500 students in the past six months um, to really plug that, that lost gap, for want of a better phrase, from a, a careers and education uh, perspective, um, raise aspirations from different careers uh, and different sectors, and also give some really great skills development around how to help young people, particularly from social, uh, social mobility cold spots, to make the right decisions for them in terms of their next step after school and after college as well. Um, and, and finally, um, work, we've, we've invested in a careers platform, uh, which is free for anyone to access, whether they're applying for a job at the co-op or, or not. Um, and that's, uh, it's an online platform to support those who are uh, furthest away from the workplace um, to, to really sharpen their, their knowledge, their, their skill set um, and, and their toolkit um, to put them in the best position to apply for jobs. And that's on our, uh, our careers website, jobs.coop.co.uk, and anybody can use that. So if anyone's got uh, connections with, with individuals who, who are needing support uh, to get into, work, into the workplace, please, please, please look at, uh, look at that as a... As a, as a channel, so that's jobs.coop.co.uk. Um, so lots of different things that we're doing. I guess the three key learnings that we've had over the past and across all of these initiatives, um, I think firstly it would be to uh, to ensure that the full colleague life cycle is engaged and on board with this uh, with this piece of work. So it's all well and good as recruiting people and and making adjustments to our resourcing process, but ultimately the support, um, the, the the right kind of welfare and well-being framework needs to be in place. Uh, to ensure that that colleague not just joins us, has a great onboarding experience, but stays with us and further develops their career with an organization as, like ours as well. Um, small changes can have a big impact. It's not just about creating pilots and programs and really shiny things, um, small things such as you know, removing uh, degrees from, from job adverts, looking uh, at behaviors-based uh, assessments rather than experience-based assessments, uh, and even transitioning some of your process offline if you can do as well, I think you know small things, but can have a massive impact. Um, and then I guess uh, the third piece I would say would be to cooperate, um, which sounds a bit cliche from the co-op, um, but it really is really important that actually you know one organisation cannot uh, solve uh, the problem of, uh, of social mobility by themselves. So working with other companies to understand best practice, um, working with partners to learn from them, um, and also to to educate them as as, as well in terms of the labour market can all can all help towards um, you know, ultimately making an impact on, on our communities and, and society as, as, as well. So those are my three key learnings, lots of things I've covered there, um, but yeah, I, I open to any questions and I'll hand over to yourself, Ed, to, to wrap up the session. Apologies for my uh, rant and, and the timekeeping there. No problem at all. Uh, thank you, Danny and Hazel. That was an uh, excellent summary of all the the uh, practices are going on in co-op and it's always great to, to, to hear of uh, real life examples of how organizations are actually uh, developing their, their policies and their processes to um, uh, make their, their um, workforces more diverse. Obviously we advise on what to do, but hearing it uh, from uh, an actual organization who is implementing uh, the things that we advise and just goes to show that it can be done and uh, how other organizations can implement uh, those as well. We have got, uh, so we've got uh, some time left to, to do a uh, Q&A session. So we've had uh, some questions come, come through, but if you do uh, have any further questions, please pop them in the, the, the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try to get uh, 
through as many as we can in the remaining time. Um, so I'll just uh, have a quick look through uh, some of the questions that have come in. Uh, so that's throughout the session. And one of the questions we came in uh, that has come in is from Anna, um, which, uh, so her question is, uh, how to develop uh, a culture that is welcoming uh, to socioeconomically diverse employees uh, and what specific actions do you suggest as a starting point? Um, so uh, looking at this from a uh, maybe taking the example of, uh, of an apprenticeships um, and how to make your organization uh, welcoming to socioeconomically diverse uh, employees, um, thinking about from an apprenticeship perspective, it's not just about the technical skills, it's also about the wraparound pastoral support and the, the, the soft skills that your organization could offer uh, to ensure that it is inclusive uh, as possible. So for instance, when we were running uh, apprenticeship uh, workshops with apprentices, one of the things that came through was that um, a, a new apprentice who was quite new to the world of work uh, didn't understand all the aspects of the, the, the wider work, not just the specific tasks, that they need to do but the, the wider world of work so we'd encourage the organizations uh, set out uh, expectations not only of the work but also uh, expectations of the wider work and how how uh, an individual who might not be as used to the world of work as some of us in this call are um, and how you would go about doing that so we'd also say that ensure that line managers have a specific training um, and something else you could also do is uh, set up a, a calendar of events. So not just, um, not just events uh, that are related to the specific work or specific tasks, but also um, the social side of work. And if there was any uh, big event that's coming up, um, set that in like a, a diary so the, the individual involved would know what's coming up. And if they had any questions about it, they could uh, uh, refer to colleagues. So on that line as well, we'd also suggest setting up a, a buddy system uh, for apprenticeships, which is good if it's somebody on a, a similar level uh, to the individual themselves. And I just thought maybe bring in uh, Hazel and Danny there. I don't know if you had any uh, further thinking on that, on how you would, uh, how co-op um, ensure that uh, it's socioeconomically uh, inclusive. I, I guess, um all of the above, Ed. The only couple of things I would add on there, one that we do do really well, the other one I've heard of other organisations do, and we, we've not quite got to that place yet. So firstly, we, we often, I think it's a couple of times a year actually, we'll have our employee survey go out and use that data to really underpin some of the, the people decisions that we make, um, particularly aligned to, to diversity, and not just within social mobility, but across different demographics as, 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 as well. And, and off the back of that comes some really interesting and innovative ideas uh, to, to improve the culture in the workplace, I guess, for people from different backgrounds. And then the only other the only other thing that we've not got in place yet, but I'm sure we will get there, but I've heard some other organizations do it really well, is um, some of you may be familiar with colleague network groups. So typically lots of different colleague network groups that are set up in different businesses. Um, but also I think, um, you know, setting up an organ a group of colleagues who, who identify as coming from maybe some of those cold spots or from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to really help inform some of those wider business decisions as well, I think uh, could be something which can add value to the organization and ultimately create a, a better place to work for, for colleagues from different backgrounds. Mm. The only thing I'd add to that is um, the work that we do with our academies, because I think that pre-engagement work, I think it is about um, allowing an opportunity to come into a place of work and actually see what it looks like, what it feels like. Um, because if you can't see yourself somewhere, then you won't be able, you know, that, that can be quite a barrier for some young people. Um, and some of the other work that we're kind of looking at, particularly from the cult young business leaders, I think it's about that confidence piece as well. So how you look to support them, so buddying and mentoring. But also we've been talking about um, how you can use those informal networks and actually build confidence that way, because some of the challenges that um, some young people have are about those um, times that they have to meet other people. 
uh, and they won't be as often or they might not have the same family connection. So how can you create informal networking opportunities that will help them to develop that confidence? But it also you can um, not orchestrate it, but you can make it so it's a more friendly environment because it is quite daunting to go into those um, spaces. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that um, is happening and could happen. And I think it's also about that collaboration as well, because if we work together and share kind of those opportunities, but also um, chances of young people to come into a business, that will help them be able to make that step. Thank you both. And I think the, the, the point, Hazel, you made on um, introducing individuals to the look and feel of work, I think is a very uh, key point, especially at uh, the earliest stage as possible. And it's something that we uh, at the SMC would recommend as well. Um, so we'll just look at some of the other questions that have come in. A uh, question from Marilyn, uh, if you don't use uh, CVs to recruit, um, and Marilyn loves the idea, uh, what do you use to identify people's skills? Uh, is it task-based uh, processes? And how do you uh, assess people's behaviours in applications? Um, so I'll just, from a SMC uh, perspective, so it's very, if you wouldn't use SMCs, one of the things that we suggest is uh, a, a task base um, process for evaluation of uh, candidates. And one of the things that would have to be uh, ensured that, that all the tasks were standardized. So for instance, if it was a, a, a role related to um, writing or briefing or reports, the task could be something along the lines of all candidates could, uh, could do a report and a simple task, but to ensure that uh, the, the process is standardized for all candidates. Um, so we would also recommend uh, competency-based uh, evaluation um, and strength-based assessments um, alongside situational judgment. So it's a combination of all these different factors uh, rather than, uh, let's say, just, a, just purely of the interview or of a CV. Um, Danny or Hazel, I wonder if you have any perspective on how you recruit uh, uh, and evaluate within the co-op? Yeah, just I guess very briefly. Um, so we would utilise situational judgment or situational assessment, which I guess is kind of similar to, to, to task based um, selection as, as such. Um, and, and I just just to call out that behavioural based questions. In, so we do still run an interview, but the types of questions that that are run or are asked in a behavioural based interview are slightly different to to that you might ask for um, for from an experience perspective uh, as, as, as well. And we, we, we tailor that as well, depending on the audience group. So particularly for, for our apprenticeship schemes, our questions are pitched in a slightly different, uh, a different way. So, but mainly I would say, you know, situational, uh, situational assessments is probably one of the, the key areas where we can assess for potential and, and potentially skills uh, over and above a, a CV as, as, as such. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, Danny. And just uh, looking at, um, Another question that's come in, could uh, loans, salary advances be used to help uh, relocate uh, talented candidates from cold spots to where job, jobs and socioeconomic opportunities are greater? So it's something that actually we do recommend if, uh, uh, if you are uh, relocating a, a specific employee or a new recruit, that you do offer um, uh, relocation allowances. Uh, something we would also suggest is um, to reimburse any travel costs, uh, just to make your process as inclusive as possible. Um, I'm afraid we've actually uh, almost run out of time, so I'm gonna have to wrap up. But um, just, to, just to say, Hazel and Danny, thank you uh, for um, uh, speaking at today's session. Um, it's always great just to get that, that real world um, experience of, of how uh, organizations actually implement uh, new policies and processes. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for offering that to uh, attendees um, and then to uh, attendees. Thank you all for uh, attending the session today. Um, so I hope you found it uh, useful uh, and have gained some of the insights on, on how to make your uh, recruitment more inclusive. Um, so I'll just give you a quick overview of some of the things that uh, the SMC has uh, coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks and months. Uh, so we've actually working on uh, specific uh, sector specific toolkits. So looking at some of the uh, barriers and drivers uh, to social mobility within sectors. Um, so we have the creative sector 
toolkit launch, and that's looking at the creative sector. And we're launching that uh, on the 11th of October. Uh, we have an apprenticeship toolkit uh, coming out on the 14th of October. So that's looking at ways that organizations can make their apprentices work for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and also the uh, retail sector toolkit, looking at some of the specific uh, issues in the retail sector that co-op has uh, also been involved in that toolkit as well. So that's going to be uh, published in October and event in November. Um, and just to finally say the next SMC masterclass uh, is going to be on outreach and that will be held on the 21st of October. Um, so all our information is uh, available um, on our website. So all our events uh, to sign up for our events and our toolkits and guidance are there. Uh, once again, thank you, Danny and Hazel. And yeah, apologies uh, for not being able to get through all the questions. But thank you uh, for joining today.